This is Woman at the Window, a painting by the Pomeranian artist Caspar David Friedrich, completed in 1822. Here is a picture that is pure domestic romance, unembellished adoration. Beginning with the interior, Norbert Wolf writes, The viewer is struck by the calculated geometry of the composition. And search for the painter who does wood better than Friedrich. Its texture, its surface variations, its solid reliability, here painted green, true to the artist's nature-loving tendencies. The floor is as clean as any interior of the Dutch. Our own view is claustrophobic. However, Friedrich achieves a sense of there being more interior space than we can see. But the important thing in the picture is her, as Norbert Wolf writes, Caroline Bomber, married to the artist since 1818, is the rear view figure looking out through an open shutter onto the river Elbe below. And the painting tells us how Friedrich feels about her. Her dress decorously conforms to the rustic interior. It is given a sheen that matches the color of the floor, and it has been given a certain resplendence even in her humble setting. With her head tilted to the left, we get a sense of fearless curiosity. The sight of the world outside does not make her brace herself, certainly not when peering out from her own home, which is her fortress. She is a happy companion, not confined by the walls, nor by the painter. She is where she wants to be. She has leaned as far as she likes. I picture wide eyes, a childlike interest in whatever thing she might be looking at, which is trivial, but to her it is new. And because it fascinates her, it fascinates us. And her lean is set against the rightward lean of the mast outside. This gives the picture symmetry, but it also creates this illusion that the mast is accommodating her, granting her some view that it had previously been obstructing. With no presumption at all, she has tapped the Earth's shoulder for a peak, and with a barely perceptible shift, it has suited her. For this weightless spirit adds not an ounce to the painter's burdens. In this picture, she is the companionable scatterer of his cares. Friedrich himself wrote this about his marriage. To some of his relatives in grief's fault, since I has been changed into we, many things have altered. There has been more eating, drinking, sleeping, talking, jesting, and laughing. Caspar David Friedrich adored this woman. She could will the sun to rise. Turning now to another painting that features Caroline on the sailing boat, which was probably completed in 1819 and purchased by a Russian Grand Duke in 1820. Here we see a boat sailing towards a city in the distance. And the bow, the bow is not as far forward as it should be, which is to say, it doesn't seem to be given the perspective of being further forward. It feels as though it has been pulled up, which is to say it has been foreshortened. It makes it look like the boat is not moving very quickly. And I have to say, one of the reasons that a Friedrich painting can make the viewer feel gloomy is because there is such stillness. But actually, what I think Friedrich has done is to grant the people who are in the picture an eternal idyll, freezing them in time, giving them an infinitely long, contented moment. And by choosing to sit the couple on the bow, the exact location where time has been most forestalled emphasizes this concept. The religiosity of the picture is clear from the distant city, in which we see a Gothic cathedral, clearly is the most prominent building, and the boat's forward construction forms a sideways crucifix, with this otherwise useless beam that curves out. And even though the bow of this boat may be pointed off to the right a little, this other beam that forms the perpendicular line of the crucifix points right towards the city. Wherever the boat may be headed, spiritually, they are going in the right direction. 
And because the sails are the same color as the distant sky, it causes the distant promise of that city to be granted on an interim basis to the peaceful occupants of the boat. The couple is united in this journey, which is to say that the journey is their spiritual life. Who is steering this boat? We have no idea. The point is probably that the two in front have faith in their heading. They do not look back to second guess their pilot. A person being tested by their ability not to look back in the direction from which they have come, comes up in the arts. The story of Orpheus and Eurydice is one example. Similarly, when Dante enters paradise in his divine comedy, he cannot enter if he looks back at the world behind him. But back to Friedrich's sailboat, the man clings harder to the view of the distant city. His wife, with her head turned, is not quite as eager. She seems to bring patience to the picture. The last picture I want to talk about is the chalk cliffs on Rügen. Rügen is where the couple went on their honeymoon. And three figures overlook these chalk cliffs. And there is disagreement as to who these figures represent. We are going to agree with Werner Hoffman and Jens Christian Jensen that the two men are both Friedrich, and it is a dual self-portrait. Now, the literature on Friedrich is very interesting to read. The writers tend to focus on the horizon line of the water, as though it is filling up these two cliffs. That is not my first thought when I look at this. So I'm going to risk being wrong. And even worse, I'm going to risk underestimating the German propensity for abstraction. It's comedy to me. I, I think the two men represent Friedrich the Bachelor and Friedrich the Married Man. The Bachelor looks off into the distance, fearless. The abyss doesn't frighten him. The great expanse of the sea captivates him. He has vision. He has courage. The other Friedrich is bowled over. His position on the ground is indecorous. It is embarrassing. It doesn't look at all intentional. It looks like he dropped something into the ravine and wants it back. His hat is on its side, as though it was not placed on the ground, but rather as though it fell. The man's cane lies uselessly at his side. His disheveled hair dangles as though he is going through a moment of real bluster and disarray. The woman's gesture is instantly recognizable to me. This is how a woman points at something that is impossible to retrieve. Her finger is not fully extended. There goes your ball into the place where you can't go get it. And the thing lost, by being unknown, requires no symbolism. It could indeed be something abstract. Like his bachelor dignity, everything possessed in the man on the right has tumbled into the ravine. Oh, there it goes, she might be saying. Your manly pride, darling, but oh look, that seagull is going to get it before you. Comedy, as always, we strive to see it in everything. Everything.